Good morning, brethren. It's very, it's very good to be here. I was corresponding with one of the brethren earlier in the week, and we were reminding each other of the words to the psalmist where he, he said, By my God, I have run through a troop, and by him I have leaped over a wall. So I said, You, you keep going, and he'll guide you through your troop, and I, he'll leap me over my wall. But look, I'm running, and you're leaping. See, but it's by our God. And I, and I, know, I know every year it's the same. At the time of renewal, it seems like walls go up and troops appear. And here we are as a testimony to our God. I give him great thanks for that. The text in front of us this morning is from Hebrews chapter 10. I want to make, uh, what I want to do is actually read some of my summary statements at the uh, beginning here so that you'll see where I'm going and the conclusions that I have come to in, in working in this text. The text is, the, the core text is Hebrews 10, 13. A lot of times we'll have a text and we'll, we'll be familiar with it and maybe we won't really be as familiar with the surrounding, the context as, as we ought to be. What caught my attention particularly was Jesus being the one that is henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. This is in the context of him as our high priest. So a lot of, this is of course lifted from Psalm 110, but a lot, of, a lot of time has gone by since that. So the apostle opens this up as, with Jesus as our high priest. But here are, the, here are the, con the conclusions that we come to in this text. The judgment or banishment of God's enemies is consecutive with and intertwined with the purposing of God's salvation of the righteous. As our brother just spoke, he, he puts down some, but see others he lifts up. But they're always intertwined, and it's always working together according to God's purpose. And also the transformation of Christ's former enemies into his now righteous servants, more than servants. He said, I call you friends, brothers, his bride. So, so that transformation has effectively provided a place of permanent rest for his name, for his glory. Thus we have a footstool as we rest our feet upon it, a place of rest for the Son of Man. Let me read several of the verses from Hebrews 10 that set this, beginning in verse 5. Now this, this of course, is speaking of Jesus, and the important thing to see is that this is taking place now, as has already been stated. This, when, it, when it says henceforth, the henceforth is actually behind us. There's a turning point when he ascended and was exalted, that's what we're talking about now. But we're going to just briefly go back and look to the, what set this up. Verse 5, Wherefore when he, that's Christ, cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Had to have a body to come. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure, no lasting pleasure. See, this, this was not something that was meant to be the final work, the old covenant priesthood. So he, so he stepped forward. He said, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I come to do thy will, O God. And then skipping down, verse 12. But this man, speaking of Christ, after, now we're, now we're getting into the time after he had offered the sacrifice, one sacrifice for sins forever, then what? Now he sat down. See, this, this, is, the, this is what we're looking at in our text. From that seated position, now, henceforth, looking and expecting and waiting till his enemies be made his footstool. Amen. Why? Because there's an accomplishment. For by one offering he has perfected forever them Amen. that are sanctified. Amen. A couple of snapshots now to set. Jesus was aware of this coming very soon. And, and the apostles were, particularly as they wrote. Here the one to the Hebrews. And I'll mention also John in the Revelation. But in response to the priest's high demand, the high priest's demand that he declare his true nature, remember he said, are you, are you really? Jesus affirmed that he was the Christ, yes. thou sayest, the Son of God. And then he foretold in two-part detail the upcoming events that would link the last days, that's the days he inaugurated or kicked off, Jesus in these last days has spoken, or God has spoken to us by his son, so it's the last days. So he linked that with the ages to come. Here's how he did it. He says, I say unto you, here, after. So you've got a here and an after. You will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of 
power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And then the other snapshot to John, the beloved disciple, as he was on the island, he had been faithful. Many years of time had gone by, and he's given to bear a record of the word of God, the word of life, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all the things that he had seen and heard and been showed to him. To him was committed a revelation this way, write the things that you have seen. Write the things which are, and then write the things which shall be hereafter. So this is where we're located in our text. From henceforth expecting, Jesus is expecting or waiting. He's, he's prepared, not idly, not, not sitting idly, but more active than we would ever think. So the administration of Jesus as unveiled in our text Expecting till his enemies be made his footstool is located in this hereafter section. It's a setting. He is here. He is here at God's right hand after appearing once in the end of the world to put away sins by the sacrifice of himself. He is here. He's establishing the second, the new covenant, after taking away the first. He is here. He's granting us boldness to enter into the holiest place by his own blood after consecrating the new and living way through his flesh. Amen. So hereafter, he is seated and exalted. So the view is current with right now, with our time. It's not visible necessarily except by faith, but it is apparent to you and to me. We, we see him, we see Jesus. He's in the presence of God for us, having entered heaven itself. And from there he is henceforth expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. Those believing in him too can fellowship in this reality. See, we're waiting too. We're expecting too. And again, not idly. We're eagerly expecting his second appearance. He's, he's, he's going to come without reference to sin, and he's going to bring us salvation. Amen. Let's think of the context where this is taken from of Psalm 110 and how it's inserted, as it were, into Hebrews. Now, we know that all of scripture is profitable, but what this meant originally to the psalmist was different when the apostle wrote it down. See, all of scripture is given as profitable. It's directed by God to address mankind in the place he put them there, where they are, he put them there, so it's gonna to relate to them according to his purpose where they are. Our text is one example of this. The Holy Spirit brings to the front an utterance from the old covenant scriptures, Psalm 110 in particular, so that all the accumulated, accumulated experience of mankind up to that date, and God hasn't been sitting idly by. See, he's been revealing things to men all during this time also. As history unfolds, men have been made to know more and more concerning God and his purpose. So he's made known here by the writing to the Hebrews more of the ancient truth that was written down by the psalmist. Not like God had changed, he doesn't change, but times and seasons do. And now there's more light available, so more revelation can come, more can be visible to mankind. Remember Jesus said, he says, you've heard that it was said of them in old time, but I say unto you. It's like an update. That's what the writer to the Hebrews is doing. The apostles would say it this way. They would say, this is that which was spoken. And, and then they would, they would just bring it right in with no interruption. So Hebrews 10, 13 in the, is in the context of Christ as the high priest and particularly his nature of expectation in this capacity. The high priest, Jesus, is expecting or waiting. Some, some of the types and shadows in the scriptures are oriented so you can see a similarity. Others are shown by contrast. For example, Moses in his house and Christ over his house. You go from like the lesser to the greater. But in our text here, it's showing a contrast. And I'm just gonna lift these from Hebrews 10. We've already read through some of them. In the Aaronic priesthood, they talked about every priest. In other words, here's one, here's one, here's one, it just continued on. But how about this one man? That's who we're talking about. The priests of Aaron's time offered the same or the repetitive sacrifices, many, same kind, same sins actually they were dealing with. But he, Christ, offered one sacrifice forever. The, all the work that they did couldn't take away sins. But Christ perfected it forever those that are being sanctified. One time, it, it did take away. He did take away sin. See? They were standing daily. 
And yet he now, he sat down at the right hand of God because it's finished, it's accomplished. Now the sacrifices of the old covenant were not inconsequential, but they were ineffective. See, they were, they were teaching, they were, they were bringing up to where we could see that they weren't enough. And so there was an accomplishment that had to be made. There had to be an effectual service of a high priest. And this is what Jesus filled. Now, seated expectation is not the cessation then of the priesthood, but it's actually just the beginning of a real working involvement in it. That's what Jesus has done. There, there had to be a mediator, one, between God and men. This is Jesus. This provided positions of advantage for, for many. And I'm in, in order, this provided, having a high priest over the household of God, this provided an advantage, as it were, for God himself. He is the supplier he is the blesser. Now he has a chosen and a qualified man, Jesus. And he's going to facilitate that transfer of benefits from there to here. See, there's also a distributor, Christ himself. He's in the nearest proximity to both God and to men. He knows, he knows those in need. He knows them. He knows their frame. And he supplies for them from the heavenly resource. Also, there's an, an advantage for the comers, ones that are coming unto God by him. They have new hearts. They have cleansed consciousness, new, new minds. All these things have taken place in the new birth. They have boldness. They have access to God. Much more. So the writer to the Hebrews here in chapter 10 and verse 13, in, in the exposition of the effectual work of our great high priest, he's making a comparison between the offerings and sacrifice under Moses' law and then the one sacrifice for sins forever Amen. by the offering of Jesus Christ's body. After affirming the singular work of Christ in regard to the putting away of sin, he is declared to be in a position now at God's right hand. That's, that's the place of power. That's the, that's the place of authority. Amen. Things happen from that position, see? Amen. But in that position, he's waiting. It, it almost seems like it would, it would be dissimilar, but it's not. See, it, it's, it's actually fitted together. He's waiting, he's expecting summarily to have his enemies be made his footstool. And yet he's involved as, God's, as God is working to, to make this happen, he's working through the sun. So the Holy Spirit is locating the realities first considered by the psalmist back in 110 to the here and now of Jesus' service in appearing now in the presence of God for us. The realities, like, like the psalmist or, or even the prophets, they would write things down. And they were true. It wasn't that they weren't. But they would be like a drift in the sea, and then all of a sudden they would be moored to the working salvation. See, that's what the apostle is doing. He's bringing and he's attaching this truth right to the high priesthood of Christ. So the promise of the Lord in 110 to, to David's Lord, he says, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The same thing is picked up by the writer to the Hebrews. He picks it up and he, and he opens it up. One of the focal points here, as we see the, as the working of God the Father and God the Son, is the relationship and fellowship and the joint administration of salvation by the Father and the Son. This is what the writer to the Hebrews is speaking of. The Son waits, the Father makes. See, he's, he's expecting until I make. That's what God said to him. The making is accomplished by the father to honor his son, but he's doing it by the diligent and faithful son as the administrator of it. So the work is one work. It's one work. The this is that principle. Peter, when he spoke to those assembled in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost, he reasoned also upon the same psalm, on the prophecy in 110. He made an application to the sequence of events that they had just witnessed before that. In the prior days, he testified of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ, and to that he linked the, ascen the ascension of Christ to God's right hand with the promise of the Holy Ghost given to David. Remember, he said this is the promise given to David, and he went all the way through, and he said this is what he really meant when he said it to David, or through David. So that same Jesus is now both Lord and Christ. Conclusion. The, he has entered into expectation, and it's described in this way. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Amen. Well, did, was this located only to David or, or confined to David? Well, certainly not, see. Jesus being in God's presence and at his right hand, this fills Jesus with joy. 
He, and the Father's countenance is now toward him, the Son, to make his enemies his footstool. Amen. This time of Jesus' exaltation and seating and expecting is in stark contrast to that which he has just endured. Remember, he had, there are the times of the sufferings of the Christ. See, this is speaking of the glories to follow. Amen. The glories are now entered into, but they were preceded by grievous sufferings. Amen. Psalm 89 it's quite a long psalm. If you're f familiar with it at, at the beginning and through the, the main body of it, it speaks of the largeness of, of salvation, but at the end it sort of has a retrospect. It looks back, and in verse 42, amidst the context of all the things coming upon the one that's suffering, it says this, Thou hast set up the right hand of his adversaries. Thou hast made all his enemies to rejoice. See, this, this is a temporary setting. This is not what we're talking about. These are located in the sufferings. Now we're talking about the glories that have followed. And the psalmist asks, how long? How long, Lord? Mm -hmm. The depths of the agonies realized in payment made for sin are now replaced and overshadowed by heights of blessing and rejoicing now that he is at God's right hand, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. The bearing of reproach then was temporary. Jesus passed under it according to the Father's will and design but he's currently expecting. He's currently rejoicing in the Father's presence. This, this he does because he has trusted in the will and the purpose of his Father. He, the Son is trusting in the Father. There's a, there was a promise given to David. It's recorded in 1 Chronicles 17. And again, this is one of those instances when you see it on a small scale when it's first given, but then it's opened up when it's the full application is made to David's seed, who is Christ. Here's what he's, God promised. He says, moreover, I will subdue all thine enemies. Amen. That's not it. It's better. Furthermore, the Lord will build thee an house. So we see, see, he linked those two together. So we see the long-range purpose in this. The, the reason for subjugation of enemies is preparing for an amazing building project. And that's what God's doing. He's going to build through Jesus Christ. There's a shadow of even, there's several shadows. I want to mention uh, the one in the priesthood, a shadow of the subduing enemies that's shown in the nation of Israel. One of the, one of the I've called it a side effect of the Aaronic priesthood was a restriction or a subduing, at least externally so, of sin. The, priest, the priests were among a separated people, Israel. People that were noted for a manner of living that was distinctive from all the nations around them. But within Israel itself, as the nation, there was a tribe, one tribe, Levi. That tribe was set apart even more so than the rest. And then within that tribe, there were ministering priests, and then especially one man, the high priest. He had narrowed down and down. And they were all associated with holiness, but the high priest the most so. So the presence of the priest in the midst of the camp, as the minister of the tabernacle, he served as a constant reminder that sin must be dressed, addressed consistently, promptly. A subduing of the enemy. Now the people, they, they could at times, they could subdue their own fleshly inclinations, but if they didn't, there was a consequence. Now they had to go to the priest. It's like a second level dealing with sin. But the ministration of the priest was, in his ministration, there was another subduing of the enemy because he would make the necessary sacrifices to deal with the offense before the defilement got out of hand, before God's judgment fell on the people. But it's different with the expectation of Jesus. His expectation anticipates a favorable and final consummation of the current work. The work of subduing, that's going to end too. The priests of Aaron's line had no such expectation. Their work, it's, it just seemed like it stretched on and on. One would pass and then another would take his place. No finality was ever accomplished in payment for sin, nor really was there any progress made in regard to cleansing the conscience from the sins. But the expectation of Jesus rests upon the resolution of both of these things. Now that sin is put away and the conscience is purged, the dealing with residual enemies is just a matter of time. See, there are enemies within and there are enemies without, but, but God is subduing these and putting them under Jesus' feet. The source and the perpetuation of enemies continues because those who harbor animosity toward God and his Christ and then his people, it's because sin is still in the world. 
There's a presence of sin. There are sinners. There are wicked principalities and powers all active in the world. And so you have residual enemies that are being dealt with at, by the exalted Christ. But the good news is the, eventual, the eventuality is that they are go, all going to be removed. This will bring an enduring and complete peace, and we fellowship and Christ fellowships with us in the knowledge of this. Even as he waits, we await that event with great anticipation, but it's at the will of the Father. See, even, it's, even Jesus himself doesn't know, he hasn't made himself to know the day. Jesus serves as prophet, as priest, as king in these capacities. Kings have enemies, prophets do too. They were they had to hide many times, but the animosity was actually not toward them directly, but it had to do with their relationship with God. It's the same thing with priests. Even priests had enemies because men were opposed to their work, what they did, who they stood for, what they were accomplishing that was against the world systems. They had a work, they had a ministry for and a ministry favored by God, and so priests had enemies. So also Christ has enemies in his service as high priest. He as our great high priest is opposed and has enemies as he himself is the executor of God's great salvation. So, it, so it's actually, it's directed through him but it's directed at God. But in this position and capacity, Christ is not currently destroying and consuming the enemies but he's serving as the revelator of their antagonism toward God. See, God, God is working this out so that as men have a response toward his Christ, he is able to, he's, he discerns their true nature toward him. He's, Christ is like the lightning rod that draws the wrath of the enemies. And what this does, it accurately indicates men's true nature. And this will all be revealed in the, in the time of the end. Let's think now about the enemies and, and distinguish. Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. See, certainly he's not talking just about the ones who crucified him. See, it's, it's much larger than this. And when I say the enemies distinguished, I mean somewhat. See, God, God knows. Who, who knowest? Thou knowest, O Lord. And yet Christ is made privy to these sort of things too, the enemies. But the formation of this footstool is taking place as a showing of God's handiwork. There's a shadow of this expectation of Christ that's seen in the installment of David as king. Remember in the old covenant times, it, it, it was over a long period of time. Saul was the first anointed king. Samuel anointed both of them, Saul and David. It's not an exact representation, but it's good to illustrate this manner of expectation. David was anointed as king while Saul was still in power. So you have Christ is exalted to the right hand of the Father, but there's still, still some activity going on. It doesn't seem like all the enemies are dealt with, see? Enemies are present. David had followers. He had ones that would go with him and protect him and align themselves with him and hide with him even. They were aligned with him in purpose and activity, but if, if you looked around, it seemed like just about everybody was aligned with Saul. If you had to take a poll, it seemed like Saul was the one that was in power. But see, God was working in, in the midst of this, his, period, his, uh, his, his purpose. So a long period of waiting and expecting took place, but it was waiting upon the timing and the management of God. David had opportunity several times to, to deal with Saul and to remove him out of the way, but he did not do it. He didn't lift up his hand against the Lord's anointed. He was waiting for the, the timing of the Lord. He was expecting until his enemies were made his footstool. Some of the enemies were removed. Some of them were actually realigned in their allegiance. They came over to David's side. Many of them were just slow to recognize God's choice. I, I believe at the, at the beginning he was uh, just anointed king over like the two tribes and then later the others were added to it. So this was a slow process and yet the opposition, those that were aligned with Saul, was growing steadily weaker and weaker. And, and with David, his was steadily being strengthened and increased. And so it is with the kingdom of Christ. Even though it's not maybe apparent, at least to the, the world's eyes, the kingdom is being strengthened and increased. And we're a part of that. But ultimately, all of Israel, 
was brought under his rule and authority, and they served him. They served David well, and they provided a peace and a rest in all of that nation. And so it is with our Christ. Also, ultimately, all will be brought into subjection. Whether, whether they continue to be antagonistic toward him or whether they have come over to his side, as it were, they're all going to be brought to be his footstool. Amen. This, this directive is given to Christ in Psalm 110, uh, verse 1. God said this to the Son. He says, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now these are orders from the, the supreme authority. The outcome is assured because the Father is, is he's committed to fulfill that placement unto its consummate end. And it will come to a consummate end. All the enemies will be subjugated. This exalted position then is by appointment. God appointed this position unto Christ. And it's in accord with a working of God that's going to require a passage of time if you measure it in earth's years. So it's, it's not something that he was exalted and that's the end. See, here we are in an in a interim period of time and we don't know how long it'll stretch, but God does. So, so it's according to the Father's working. So we, we're, we're glad for this situation. So the enemies of God and those of his son are various and many. Our brother read from Psalm 1, 2, or Psalm number 2. It calls them there the kings and judges of the earth. See, that's like one kind of enemy. Some of these are spoken of there. They seem like they're permanently fixed in opposition to the Lord and his anointed one. Yet, their aggression even is in a state of continuous flux because they die. They are born, they align themselves against God, they shake their fists, and then they die. And they await final judgment from a fixed region of irremediable unbelief. See, they, they can't come back and make it right. Amen. But the, the total numbers of these accumulate. If you were, you know, you, you, we'd lose track, but if you go back, there are many, many like this. And yet, as our brother said, where are they now? They multiply exponentially because they have influence over other men. Each one, though, personally ceases in his own power because he dies. He's gone but altogether they form an aggregate of enemy personalities. So that's one kind of enemy. They're aligned against God. Their breath is spent. Their brief encounter is shuttered. Guess what? They've failed to dispose the reigning king and acting high priest of God. So they have increased the size and density of Christ's footstool by default. They have been made his footstool. There's a second kind that we note. Other enemies inhabit places of unseen dominion. Included, you would have the unholy angels, the wicked principalities and powers, all those that are dwelling in the spiritual realm that's united under Satan. Their influence and authority is not abbreviated by death. It continues on. And yet, there's going to be an ultimate frustration to their purpose. Eventually, their working is going to be terminated, and that timing is not at their discretion. See, they don't, they don't, so, so they're, they're agitated, as it were. Yes. Beings in other capacities, if they are awakened to their impending cessation, they may repent or give up, turn themselves in, as it were, change direction. But in the case of this spiritual realm of the wicked principalities, their approaching doom actually just seems to foment their activities. They just become more active. Mm -hmm. Increasing levels, the devil hath great wrath, and he knoweth that he hath but a short time. But here's the thing, again, the surety of the outcome and approaching judgment is reacted against in their frenzied displays of power, so they rage. They, they, even, they even cause men to rage, but they also will contribute to the footstool of rest for Christ because they will have a timely and final removal from all activity. They'll be gone. They have been made his footstool. Amen. There's another category of enemies that's transitioning from service or to service as Christ's footstool. Now this, this would be one that I, that I looked into most directly that, that will pique our interest even more. In the old covenant record of God bringing peace and rest to his people, not all the enemies were overthrown directly or by military power. See, sometimes there was like an assimilation, a former enemy was brought into the safety of God's favor, and, and uh, that former enemy is now sheltered by being blessed by him. Faith is the needle that sewed them into the fabric of the footstool of service and rest. Remember Rahab? Yes, 
Remember Ruth, the Moabitess. Remember the widow of Sidon, Naaman the Syrian, and others. So this illustrates the blessed nature of salvation, that God is able to deal with an enemy and now bring him to, into a position where he's been made to serve him willingly. There's an association in the scriptures of a footstool with rest. Is there a shift portrayed in the treatment of enemies through the developing years of time and spoken to in the New Covenant? I think so. Remember Christ, he, he said things about enemies that people had to think a lot about. He said, I say unto them, or I say unto you, treat, treat your enemy well. And he essentially is going to do that. He's going to, he's going to bring his enemies into subjugation, but he's going to do it by showing mercy to them. That's the point. What's it like to be willing in the day of his power? Well, I know. Do you know? <laughs> a footstool then is not pummeled into existence. See, it's carefully crafted. It's laboriously formed. The enemies are being made such, and they're under the mighty hand of God. He raises up one, and he puts down another, and yet they're all made to be Christ's footstool. So God, in doing this, is demonstrating his wisdom. His wisdom is forming a place of rest for the dominion of his son. This footstool continues to provide utility and even comfort, you could say, for the divine purpose and working. It will provide a place from which Christ can work in the ages to come, and God through him. Written several times in the Psalms and Prophets is this phrase, Heaven is my throne, and the earth my footstool. This is like the, the baseline presentation for the dynamic of this. In other words, there's a needfulness for a footstool. There's a place of reigning, but there's a necessity for a footstool also. So God is carefully constructing this for Jesus' feet. Let's think of the activity of the holy angels in regard to this exalted working of, of bringing enemies into subjection. In Hebrews chapter 1, the question is put forth in, in uh, talking in comparison of Jesus and the angels and what God committed to the one man, Christ, and to the angels as a group. Some distinctions are made, and Hebrews 1.13 reads, To which of the angels did God say at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Angels are known and feared. They're mighty. Especially when they administer judgment. Yet the same mighty ones that now, again by the word of Hebrews tells us this, they're ministers unto the heirs of salvation. Those heirs at one time, a former time, were alienated and enemies in their mind by wicked works. But now, they're reconciled. See, so the angels are going to work with them differently, too. The enemies were delivered from the power of darkness, and they're translated into the kingdom of his dear son. So now they're no longer enemies. The angels can get on board, as it were, by divine placement into this project of salvation. Now, I'm not saying that, that they're saved. I'm, it's talking about the project of saving men from their sins. The angels are able to participate in that work. But this is not their initial understanding of reckoning with enemies. A large portion of their number was cast out because they aligned themselves against God, and they were constituted his enemies and cast down from heaven itself. But there's a shift in emphasis here. There's an acceleration of understanding that has taken place, beginning with the bringing of the first begotten into the world. See, remember when he, when he brought him in, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. See, so they, their eyes were opened unto new realms of understanding that he's going to unfold for them. Their not, angels are not noted for compassion to their enemies. But here, in this current exaltation of Christ and the work that is accomplished and the subduing of enemies, they're subjected to an unfolding panorama of mercy rejoicing over judgment. Amen. They were the ones, as in Psalm 24, that opened heaven's gates to the one that was just freshly returning from the land of the enemy. Having observed him shedding his own blood for the remission of sin for a race that was wholly infected by it. They saw him go down and come back with the promise that he would bring others to be with him. Former enemies. This king of glory had taken on the seed of Abraham. 
he assumed the responsibility for, and he procured righteously a redemption of natural born enemies, natural born of Adam. The work, he did it by causing them to be born again. The work on this portion of the footstool was grueling, arduous, demanding. Actually, it was impossible for any but him. Only the Son of Man would be able to accomplish this. And it was, and, and when I say was, it's not finished, it was and is an extended work, initiated by the removal of that which actually constituted men as enemies to God, their sin. That was removed. And then it continues through a heaven-based priesthood, and it's designed to administer grace to help in their time of need. From heaven, here's what, here's what we hear from heaven. He says, he says unto men, now is the expected time. Now is the day of salvation. And Jesus at the right hand of God, he hears this. Sit, sit there a while longer at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And from earth here, we see him. We see him in that position, expecting, waiting. But, again, not idly, but active in succor or help to those that are tempted. And saving to the uttermost those that are coming to God by him. This is the manner of expectation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So these ones also are made his footstool in a most glorious manner. What about the small word till or until, until? This piques my interest. We anticipate an after time until the enemies be made your footstool. There's a rest that's desired by God. Yes, amen. A rest in the sense of bringing something to a completion and a finality so that new works can be begun. Not a rest as in a rest from tiredness as we experience. But this rest is desired by God, but it's on behalf of his son. He's making the footstool for him. It's not sought to any fatigue on the part of either one of them or any kind of a weariness of their united work in this long endeavor. But there is an interim period of waiting while making. This serves as like a hinge or a point of pivoting from a former to a latter stage of demonstration. God has more to show. Amen. Expecting by Jesus is evidencing his trust in his Father. Making on God's part is verifying his love for the Son and his approval of him. So the rest will be accomplished at length. And it will provide a stable foundation for building in the ages to come. And we desire to look into these things, too. I'm going to read from uh, the scriptures, uh, first from First Chronicles, as a setting of God speaking unto men, somewhat by bits and pieces. And then I want to also read from the Psalms as we, as we come to a conclusion of noting how God has arisen and is working to provide a footstool for his son. David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in my heart to build an house for rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build an house for my name. See the disappointment that even accompanied this. See, his, he was a man of war. And again, this was God worked in this. But he said unto Solomon his son, he shall build my house. God said this actually of Solomon. He said, he shall build my house, your son. He'll be, he'll be a man that's noted for a kingdom of peace and my courts. I have chosen him to be my son and I will be his father. So even on, on the low level of revealing, David would not be the one chosen and yet Solomon would. See, there's never a finished accomplishment in this. There's a greater rest that's going to come for the son. So David said to Solomon, Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build an house for the sanctuary, so be strong and do it. This is, a, this is a picture of the exalted Christ, in strength and doing it. Amen. Ephesians 2, As a greater than Solomon has arisen to this building project, now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, your fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Ha, there's the house that's being built, see? And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And then we have the in whom's. In whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. 
So this conclusion, again, the judgment or banishment of God's enemies is consecutive with and intertwined with the purposing of the salvation of the righteous. See, all the enemies are being brought into service unto the Son. Amen. And then he's, see, he's going to present up this, this manner of subjugation unto the Father as he himself is subject also. So the transformation of Christ's former enemies into his now righteous servants has effectively provided a place of permanent rest for his name and his glory, and the Son's name and his glory. Psalm 68, let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. But, here he is intertwining the two, but let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. From Psalm 132, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. See, Jesus is the ark of God's strength. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he has desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. But his enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. So we see Jesus henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool.